everybody. Welcome to our very first AWE Night SF event in collaboration with AWE New York and the Spatial Team. I'm Patrick Johnson, co-organizer of AWE Night SF and CEO of Rock Paper Reality. And I've just got to say, we've got an incredibly special show planned for everyone tonight, featuring the one and Ori, one and only Ori uh, Inbar, <laughs> founder of AWE. It was, it was a pretty good Freudian slip and uh, of Super Ventures and Abby Frazier, VP Marketing at Larvol. And, um, and also I believe the spatial team is gonna do a little bit of talking about the platform as well. Ori is going to be giving a walkthrough of AWE's history and what's to come for the upcoming event in Santa Clara, November 9th to 10th. Um, and just before we get started, I want to welcome everyone to join the conversation on social channels using hashtag AWE Night SF. So please post about the event. Um, we'll also be recording and live streaming tonight's event so you can relive the awesomeness and be sure to share it with your friends. We're just about at that 5,000 person. We've been, uh, we've been there for a while now. We really wanna hit it. So just um, spread the good word. And finally, if you plan on attending the AWE conference in November this year, uh, we have a special discount code that offers 20% off both the three day and the two day all access passes for the AWE Night SF community. And I'm sure right there's a here. special one, Ori, that you can share with the uh, the New York one as well. You got it? So for SF, it's AWE Night SF 20D um, on checkout, and that'll give you your 20% discount. So that's all I've got. Uh, are you guys all ready for the show? <laughs> all right, let's kick it off with Ori. Um, Ori, let me go ahead and welcome you to the stage. Give it up for Ori. Hey, everybody. This is where we're starting the tour, so we want to gather around. You may stay seated so we can actually see everybody. Thank you for joining All Night SF and New York City with Spatial. It's a very special meetup for us today. And it's not really, it was never about AWE. It's about the history of XR, but through the lens of the AWE conference, which we like to think has been kind of following the ups and downs of the industry and helped make a dent along the way. So as you can see here, we have a bunch of, uh, of images. Instead of slides, I'm going to walk through, uh, through them and tell the story. But let's keep it interactive. So I'm going to ask you questions. I want to hear people participating. If you have comments or questions or anything to, to say about what we're talking about, please jump in. We'll see if we can manage that without uh, having too many voices at once. But we've got to try it out. I want to have just special thanks for the organizers of this meetup, Patrick, Tom, and of course, Wen and Myung, which put this an incredible layout together. Uh, for me, it's, it's going to be a, a huge thrill to, to go through that with you guys. Ready to get started? Woo! Woo! All right. Oh, I can see myself. That's scary. No, please don't show it to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to start here. You see the start sign. And we're going to do a complete tour and then look into the future. So yeah, AWD started in 2010. As you can see, it was uh, still called ARE or Augmented Reality Event. A few entrepreneurs got together, decided that it's such an early stage in this industry that we have to join forces and get the people together and start advancing it. Uh, so T-Shoot, which you may know, Worley, Andrea Lowry, which is here somewhere in the room, still with us. 12 years later, um, we put it together. We had, you know, like 300 people in a room. Very weird experience for the fact that, you know, nobody really understood outside of that room. Nobody really had an idea what AR is about. And we were talking about, you know, concepts, ideas. We weren't really showing real products at the time. Uh, so it was pretty fun. Um, and as you can see, we had this really awkward tagline, I are here which up until today, we still don't know exactly what it means. But I guess the idea was that if up until now, nobody really heard about AR, AR is here now, and people need to start paying attention to it. Uh, I, of course, had my amazing cyberpunk glasses, which I still wear every conference to date. And yeah, it was awesome. By the way, as you can see here, we have plaques next to each image. So if you want to kind of read now or afterwards uh, a little bit more con to, to get more context about it. All right, so why did we start AWE or ARE as it was first called in 2010? What happened then that triggered the need for such an event? So let's look at our next panel right here. 
AR, of course, did not start then. It started in 1968 or 9, but then was hidden in labs all around the world. Just a few people were really passionate about it, were playing with it, were doing some cool stuff, like this amazing thing, which looks, I, I still like to say, it looks ridiculous and awesome at the same time. Anyone can guess what this is? Ghostbusters? Ghostbusters? No, <laughs> but it does look similar. That's right. <laughs> So this was a game called Quake AR. It actually, I think the first demo was done in like 2003 or four. Some really talented scientists and developers put it together. And this, I believe this photo is from 2006 or seven, where it was kind of a more advanced version. And you can see they have everything there. They have the goggles, they have a huge GPS tracker on the back with a computer and even a controller. It looks like a toy gun. And, you know, if you watch some of these videos, they look Again, ridiculous and awesome at the same time. Everything rattles around. You can't really understand what's going on. But you're actually fighting quake monsters inside the university with occlusion, with everything, guys. This was incredible. Of course, they were trying to productize it to, to make it, you know, something that can be sold to consumers. It was way, way, way too early for that. You know, no computer power, not enough, you know, algorithms were not there. And of course, awareness level was zero at the time. So it was pretty tough. You know, the iPhone at the time was not there or Android phones were not there. So people used whatever devices they had. So, so this is the mobile device at the time it was pretty customizable. So you see they added a camera, they added GPS, also a whole bunch of wires in the back. And that actually enabled you to walk in the room and scan it and be able to place AR content in there. So it actually worked, but again, who would use this, right? Nobody. So again, that's the, that's the world in, in 2010. Oh, sorry, up until uh, 2010. And then I'm gonna to move to the next one. And this is what happened in 2009, right? So first you had the iPhone announcement. All of a sudden you had this perfect device for AR. Um, with all the ingredients, you know, with GPS, with uh, sensors, with uh, uh, an SDK. Actually, when it launched, the SDK was very limited and you had to jailbreak the phone in order to be able to develop AR content for it, which is what Vuforia did. Vuforia is kind of the first major tracking uh, system. Uh, but there was not much done on mobile devices at the time. Most of it was done on webcams, like this one. If you see kind of the, the campaign here from... General Electric, sorry, GE Electric, I can't remember uh, the name exactly, but they created this amazing campaign that was working with the webcam. So you would point this pa paper that you, you could print yourself at home, and then this incredible scene unfolded uh, to help educate people about uh, you know, windmills and, and uh, how they, you can use it for sustainability. But I think up until today, this, the visuals here in, in, in the interactivity was pretty top notch. Of course, we had this little thing here. Android also popped up, and right away, uh, a guy from Salzburg, Austria, created this uh, incredible application called Wikitude, which allowed him. I mean, <laughs> that video is still so cool. You can watch it on YouTube. He kind of points the uh, the Android phone to a, a hill three miles away. And it pulled information from Wikipedia and showed information about that, the castle on that hill. That was mind blowing. Everybody kind of got really excited about that. Um, you ha have, of course, this uh, card with a baseball player on it. Anyone knows what company did this? Facebook, Google. Not Facebook or Google. This is from Total Immersion. Total Immersion was the top dog in 2009 and, and 10 in terms of uh, AR, um, they were making the most money, they had the, the best technology, and at the time they were the top dog. And then you have this uh, cover for Esquire magazine. It wasn't the first, but it was the most talked about campaign in AR up until that point. Of course, with Robert Downey Jr. sitting in this position, it made a lot of noise. And then yeah, Google Goggles started at the time. Uh, that, of course, became Google Lens, and now it's really integrated into uh, most of, of Google's products. Uh, but it started back then and was kind of the first glimpse into using visual search. Uh, I, I missed this one, Xbox Kinect. 
which was another big, big player in AR at the time. And it allowed, you know, gesture interaction for activations for campaign and a bunch of things. So, so that's, that's a lot of uh, things that happened pretty much in 2009. And that was kind of the big trigger uh, for AWE. Uh, we felt like an industry is being born and there's a need to really uh, help make it happen. So let's take a look at the next panel right here. This is from Google Trends. And it shows how the interest in AR, just based on uh, Google, Google searches, was pretty much flatlined up until 2009. And then all of a sudden it skyrockets. Again, another, uh, clarific, um, another kind of reason for this, uh, for AWE to, to be born. I want to point out this, this next slide, which is the top, uh, the, sorry, the Fortune 1000 companies that actually attended the first first AWE in 2010. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, you have companies here like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, which they've been doing AR way before anyone uh, in, in the business world. Uh, and of course, we're, we're kind of showing some of their work at the event, but also a bunch of uh, consumer packaged goods like P&G, PepsiCo, Kimberly-Clark that realized that there's huge potential in using AR for enhancing their product packaging. Of course, you have you know the big players, uh, Qualcomm, Google, Amazon, Microsoft. They're all here, and they all stayed in it and invested a lot. Apple is still missing here, but they will come in in a second. Uh, and all the other players, you know, Adobe and Autodesk realized this is going to be the next three D uh, design tool. So you have to kind of get into it. So that's, that's Fortune one thousand companies. Now let's look at the top dogs which is in the next panel right here. Um, these are all the companies that exhibited or spoke uh, at AWE in 2010. Uh, again, you can see Total Immersion as by far the number one, followed closely with Mitayo. Um, Total Immersion was, was a French company, Mitayo a German company. They actually also started in about 2004. Um, and by this time, uh, they had, you know, one of the, the best uh, SDKs for mobile, uh, as well as a browser, AR browser. And of course, Vifuria is here, just freshly acquired by, uh, by Qualcomm. Uh, I would love to tell you the story about how I was involved in, in this, uh, in the step uh, of kind of Vifuria becoming what it is, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll leave it for maybe afterwards when you have some more time. AR Toolworks, open source AR, which was cool. Of course, Wikitude, and then some other names that you may recognize but are not here anymore, like Layer, Across Air. But here, Occipital, still going strong. Uh, who else? Uh, let's look at some of the acquisitions. 13th Lab, very, very strong uh, SLAM capabilities out of Scandinavia. Anyone knows who acquired it? No one? I mean, you can choose from, from probably three or four companies that did most of the acquisitions since then. Uh, Facebook, Apple, um, Google, and uh, Snapchat and Niantic, I guess. I mean, although Niantic at that point were not, was not making acquisitions. Uh, so, yeah, 13th Lab was acquired by uh, Apple at the time, and it was kind of helped them uh, advance their uh, tech capabilities. And then, of course, Augmento, a company that I founded um, back then, which later was acquired also. Anyone knows by whom? Apple. That's right. And that, that kind of became the foundation for ARKit. Uh, and then in the bottom, you can see a bunch of uh, smart glasses companies. And amazingly, you have Lumos, Vuzix, and Digilens, which are still going strong, one of the leaders in the space. Others didn't make it uh, so much. So that's kind of the... Uh, where we were with the top dogs in AR back then. Now let's move to some of the people. These are all the speakers that we had back then. And you can see again that many of these names are still some of the top voices, top thought leaders in the space. Um, you have, you know, uh, Paul Travers, CEO of uh, Vuzix. You have uh, Mark Billinger, so of course, still one of the leading in and, and Stephen Feiner, one of the leading researchers in AR. Christine Perry, that founded the area and uh, one of the leading consultants in AR for Enterprise. 
Uh, and a lot more. You even have an investor, Kurt Westcott, which invested in Methio and was talking about kind of his experience from an investor perspective. So do we have anyone from this list here today with us? Oh, Marco Tempest, of course. If you miss Marco, the uh, AR magician, which became a legend since then with, you know, like a top TED speaker and so on, Avi Barzev. And, uh, and on the art side, we have Ellen Papagianis, which is has been kind of the, one of the first major artists to focus their work on AR and still is going strong with that, uh, as well as Amir Baradaran, which is uh, also kind of one of the first artists that jumped on this bandwagon. I think we're running late, so let's uh, move a bit quicker. I'm going to go to the next one. If you look at the, um, uh, the interest in AR at that time, it was kind of a flattening or going even down at some point. And the question is why? After this so much excitement around AR, why did that happen? Well, I think one of the main reasons is that um, the AR browsers became uh, well, kind of disappointing because the experience that was promised there was not good enough, especially in cities when you were pointing your phone up to see a restaurant and the restaurant was actually behind you. All these kind of things uh, were kind of spelling some disappointment from AR until Google Glass. Google Glass. And Google Glass, Google Glass, I like to say, is the best thing that happened for AR and also the worst thing that happened to AR. Best thing because, of course, the level of awareness grew skyrocketed at that time. Uh, you know, whenever, whenever I was traveling, the immigration officer asked, you know, what do you do? And up until that point, I had to explain AR, and it was a very long and awkward discussion. But after this, when I would say, you know, I'm in augmented reality, people would say, oh, like Google Glass. Here you go. So awareness uh, definitely uh, went to the sky here. But of course, we all know the flop in terms of the market uh, acceptance of this. Uh, and that kind of created a, almost like a, a trough of disillusionment around smart glasses for a number of years. Okay. But let's, look, let's, move, let's move forward here into some of the glasses that uh, were me some in 2013 uh, in the market. Really cool, cool looking glasses. Uh, you can see, of course, Google Glass. Uh, cool to see kind of the first meta, which was taking the Epson and kind of covering it with some lenses, plastic, and a depth camera. Uh, we have ODG, which went belly up since then. Recon, acquired by Intel. Uh, so remaining from this list is still Google Glass, Epson, Vuzix, Lumus, and Coppin, right? These are kind of the ones that survived since then and are still going strong. And, and that leads us to um, 2015. So 2015, we, we, uh, two things happened. One is VR uh, resurrected after you know, a couple of, almost a couple of decades being, uh, I guess, clinically dead, uh, came to life, you know, with, with the Oculus uh, about, uh, I guess, about a year and a half earlier, and then acquired by Facebook. So uh, we brought in kind of the VR community. We worked with Upload uh, to bring together the AR and VR world. And since then, of course, they were intertwined. And we chose this, this theme of... Uh, superpowers because we believe that the idea that AR and VR can help you become better at anything you do, give, it basically gives you superpowers. And that message really resonated very well with the community. All right, moving back here. The same year, we also started AWE in China. So of course, we adapted the, the heroes to, anyone knows what this is? The terracotta soldiers in China, uh, near Xi'an. Uh, so that's kind of their superhero. Everybody got it immediately over there. Uh, but of course, the, the idea of uh, going into China was that no matter what, it represents the biggest market for AR. And we knew that the community has to be connected tightly into what's happening in China, you know, to really be able to capture the full opportunity. So now let's look at wh where are we with the trends? So we saw, you know, the first kind of AR browsers and campaigns in 2009 and 10, kind of doing kind of a big jump. Then Google Glass, 
then kind of a lull area, you know, the 13, 14, 15, wasn't really a lot happening there until three things happened. Pokemon Go, no need to say much more about that. HoloLens introduced uh, as kind of the, the best. Wait, did I, I miss some things? And, anyway, never, never mind. Uh, and uh, HoloLens is kind of probably the best AR headset we've ever seen. And, uh, and Snapchat, popularizing the idea of AR through uh, social filters. So the, the opening keynote in, in 2016 felt so much better than the last few years with all this craziness happening around AR, so much interest. Uh, although it was, you know, gaming and social, but it gave a lot of energy to the whole movement. Uh, and then after that in 2017, that was really the big breakthrough with AR Kit, AR Core, uh, kind of being born uh, actually right after AWE that year, um, but giving, again, feeding a lot of energy into everything and, and really starting this incredible movement among developers to start developing for AR and VR. And that's, of course, where, when the AR Cloud idea uh, came about uh, because, you know, we felt like AirKit and AirCore are great, but they're not going to enable the mainstream to adopt it because, of course, AR has to be persistent and shareable. Until then, it's only going to be a niche product. So these are some of the milestones. Let's move on. Um, at that point, you know, we felt like we have to elevate the message beyond just, you know, making us all better, but also use this technology for the good of society. So it's now superpowers to change the world. And we, we brought a lot of use cases that were proving that point. And then in 2018, that's, that really felt like a, a turning point in the, the market. Uh, we were starting to see revenues growing, 41,000 companies adopting it across the board, it meaning AR and VR. And it felt like we're at this point about to jump. Was it true? Uh, pretty close, but <laughs> probably a bit too early. Um, and the theme of that year was, actually, this was not the real theme. The theme was go XR or go home, because we felt like this maybe is too harsh. But I, I still think that was the right message, because it felt like, you know, we're, we're getting into a new wave of technology. And if we don't adopt it, and when I say we, it's enterprises, developers, investors, 41,000 companies, then you'll just go extinct like all the previous wave of technology. And lo and behold, just look at the number of uh, Fortune 1000 companies participating in the event, speaking or participating. You see representation from almost every single industry. Pretty amazing list. So kind of to summarize, you know, the, the growth of uh, AWE from 2010, where it was just a tiny little corner in the convention center in Santa Clara to occupying the entire space uh, in 2019. And of course, that became kind of the main draw at this, at this point because people came in to try out all these amazing new gadgets. So we're almost completing the tour now. Uh, going back to 2010. So in 2010, you know, when, when the conference started, it actually was produced by a nonprofit organization called augmentedreality.org. And we, we said, you know, we have to find a, a mission that unifies the entire community, everyone in it. Uh, and that message was to advance augmented reality, to advance humanity with a moonshot of inspiring, it's a crazy number, 1 billion users of AR by 2020. By far the, the craziest prediction ever made. But incredibly, this is here from the Facebook F8 in 2019, where they announced that a billion people have tried AR experiences. This is just with Facebook, not even including Snapchat. So, you know, you could argue these were not active users. I think today we're probably around the 600 million active users or getting there. But that's incredible that we actually achieved this goal. So now kind of looking forward into the future, if in the past 10 years was really about getting the community to together and creating awareness and penetrating the mainstream. I think you all agree that we're now entering the mainstream and now we need to look forward into the next 10 years. Uh, the next 10 years is what you can see here on the Spatial World front page, which is kind of an exercise that we did last year, 
try to envision, instead of taking step by step how we'll get to the future, let's look back from 2030. What's the world that we want to live in by then with the impact of AR and VR on all aspects of our lives? And again, here we can spend probably a day just arguing about this. The first question is, why would anyone use a newspaper in 2030? But, uh, and the thing that you can see here is Zuck is still there, hasn't aged a day, which is another <laughs> proof he's a robot. You can see that, you know, privacy is going to be a big thing over the next 10 years. And I predicted that, you know, privacy will be won by consumers. So we can talk a lot about how we get to that point. But you can see, you know, the market size is $1 trillion by that time, 3 billion daily users of AR and VR. The AR cloud is really covering almost the entire world in real time and, and gets through first. So a lot of good things, including impact on healthcare, on how to reskill a lot of the uh, employees that were let go because of automation and many other things. So this is it, November 9 through 11 in Santa Clara. The big thing I want to say about this is that it's going to be in person, not like this, which is what is getting everybody excited, and me too. We can try some new gadgets, we can meet each other. It's going to be fantastic. And again, you have this special discount code here you can use for a 20% discount. But if you want to speak, if you want to exhibit, this is a great time to submit online. Just go to our website. That's all I have. I think it took twice as long as I was allocated, but hopefully you got something out of it. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Ori. Appreciate that it. That was really good, Ori. All right. So I would say either Jake or Abby. I mean, to be honest, like either or right now, who's ever ready to kind of present next, I think it would be great to kind of get a lowdown of the spatial uh, environment. But take Sure, we're a package yeah. deal, I think. All right. Yeah, exactly. I think I'll, I'll start now. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Abby. I think a lot of people, um, you know, that are part of the the amazing AWE uh, organization are, are very familiar with space in a lot of respects. Um, but we've come, I think, a long way um, over the last over the last few years, especially over the last year or so. Um, so, hi everybody. Um, Jake Steinerman. I am uh, Spatial's head of community. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you to the whole AWE group for uh, AWSF and AWE New York and um, for putting this on and for hosting it in Spatial. This is super exciting. I think especially because I just noticed that the 2021 theme for AWE is it's time to go spatial. Um, so that I think that is, we had no part in that tagline, but I think we are very much in favor of that tagline for many reasons, um, which is really great. Um, so it's really awesome to, to have you all here. Um, I think for those who, who are uh, familiar with Spatial or have heard of us, um, you know, we're, for those who haven't, um, you know, we're uh, a platform that just allows you to create virtual spaces that bring everyone together. And that's, of course, never been more important than it has been over the last year. You know, we've all had Zoom fatigue. We're all tired of sitting in front of our computers. Uh, I think it's been a huge breakout moment for XR and, and uh, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of it. Um, and it's been really incredible to see. Um, for those who know, again, for those who know Spatial, um, you know, we got our start originally back in 2017, um, really focused on uh, augmented reality and productivity. How can you make people feel like they're in the same place um, even when they're not? For really starting on the Microsoft HoloLens um, and then have your colleagues have your colleagues join you as um, you know, holograms of themselves, you know, virtual representations of themselves in augmented reality. Uh, and then over the past year, we've really seen a shift in, uh, you know, a lot higher interest in um, all kinds of devices, um, you know, primarily virtual reality devices like the Oculus Quest um, and the Quest 2, which has hit the market over the last year. Because um, people want to be in other spaces. They want to feel that sense of presence uh, next to each other. They want to go to faraway worlds. And they want to go really anywhere they can. And virtual reality allows you uh, to do that. So we've seen a huge uptake um, in virtual reality across all different um, kinds uh, of sectors and platforms. Um, so we've really come a long way from, from where we started in being an AR productivity platform to really being, uh, uh, really where we're going is is essentially a metaverse platform, allowing people to easily create spaces and worlds without having to be developers and designers, and then share those spaces and experiences um, with whoever they want. 
Um, so we've had a big focus on really, we've called it five seconds to spatial. How do you get people into you know, a virtual environment super, super, super quickly? And a big part of that um, has been accessibility uh, and rolling out you know, access to these environments across any platform, uh, including the web, which uh, I think a number of you are on here uh, joining from the web. And that's been a really big, uh, you know, really big for us to, to get to that point. Um, so it's been really exciting to see almost like a whole new generation of users joining from uh, really experiencing, you know, what's, uh, you know, the metaverse really. And you heard Facebook recently come out and said they want to be a metaverse company. Uh, I think that term is going to start to take hold a lot more and you're going to have a lot more people get exposed to this because the technologies are getting better. You can access these spaces from web browsers. Uh, the Oculus Quest in particular, of course, one of the most popular devices on the market um, is getting crazy adoption, both with consumers um, and, uh, and with enterprises. Um, so I think, I think, you know, the technology usually speaks for itself and you're all in spatial now. I'm not going to go into different features of the platform. I think the best way to, to really understand what it's capable of isn't really to hear from me. I mean, I can talk about spatial all day. Um, I think it really the best way to hear about it is from someone and an organization that uses it every single day um, for absolutely everything they do. Uh, that's why I asked uh, Abby here from Larval. They're an incredible company that's actually been remote first for a long time, what, since 2004 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but ha have, and I'll let you get into all this, but they've actually gone VR first and spatial first for absolutely everything that they do. Um, so Abby, I'll let you take it away and get into all the different ways you're using yeah. VR. And it's really incredible to see you guys kind of take the mantle um, and really be a leader uh, in this space. So go for yeah. it. Yeah. Sure, sure. This is fun. I really needed that walkthrough. Thank you, Ori. This is my first introduction to AWE and to, to some of the world of AR. I started at Larval in uh, January as they were in the middle of this transition. So I come from a background in marketing and ed in education marketing. So I knew, you know, cloud-based curriculum, but I didn't know anything about this world. So I've been um, dove in head first. Um, but the company, if you don't know Larval, um, is, a, is a totally remote company. It's been around about 15 years. Um, and we are kind of the mini Bloomberg for pharma. We sell intelligence, reporting data to, to pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies. Uh, we work with all 15 of the top 15 pharma that you've heard of and, and a lot of the little guys doing amazing things. Um, we're especially interested in um, cancer research and being a part of the solution for, for that enormous human need of cancer. So um, our, our CEO, Bruno Larval, is, uh, is an innovator at heart. He's, he's experimented with everything there is as technology has evolved. And as soon as um, someone put a headset on his head, he said, there's something here. So the initial interest on his part was how can we use AR and VR to, to display cancer data, to, to, to give our customers a better picture of of what they're, they're dealing with or a clinical trial or to get to get oncologists in the same space to talk about um, to talk about what they're learning. Um, but quickly, he also learned this would be a better way to collaborate with our team. We have a team of about 200 uh, team members all across the world, huge portion of those in, in countries not the U.S. So they've we've always struggled with collaborating and, and wanting that next thing. By the time everyone was getting Zoom fatigue this year, we, they had it, you know, five years ago. So they started out having team meetings on MSN Messenger and just always wanted the next thing. So as soon as the headset was an opportunity, he had a Quest 2. He got a few of the other executives Quest 2s and they started to experiment with this. Um, and it didn't take long for it to become the goal to go VR first. Um, and that did take some some convincing, right? It's a little bit of a headache to try a new technology, um, literally sometimes and, and figuratively. But um, as soon as you got people in the same room, we found that uh, the same space, like spatial, actually is the place that we this this clicked for us. We were in that auditorium space, which if you haven't seen, is pretty amazing. And and it, it's not it's a beautiful sunset outside. We're all in the same room, ten or so of us, and it feels like we didn't know we were missing this connection. It felt so much more real and so much more human even though we don't have legs and we all looked very strange, it felt more human. And that was a really cool experience. And from there, it just became the mission to go all the way. So at this point, we've committed to being VR first. Uh, Bruno's probably in his headset eight hours a day. I, I tap out at like five, but we do everything we can 
in in spatial and and in experimenting with other platforms too and tools but spatial we've we've found we've built our headquarters there so um as of now we have i think about 60 percent of the company on headset and more coming as they reach sort of you know three month or one year milestones it's kind of part of our uh, onboarding process and we have our own you know solo rooms i have a marketing team room where my team can play tic-tac-toe and 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 experiment with whiteboards we have uh, an NFT art gallery that we had custom built to host events like this one. Um, we have um, a ton of different spaces and we're making new ones all the time to the point we needed a VR intern to help us keep our, you know, <laughs> keep our books and keep things in order. So it's been a really neat, um, a neat tool for us for collaboration and, and proximity um, too. So I'm a, uh, I didn't know I was going to be such a huge advocate for VR this year, but it's become a huge part of, of what I do and how I think about um you know even where we can go in the future we've committed now i think bruno says we're the first colony on the metaverse so the first company doing this you guys would tell me tell me if i'm wrong but to be a company that has nothing to do with selling you know vr or software or head headsets but to be there just because we believe in it and we believe that's the future um so we're the first colony on metaverse and i'm sure you'll all come and join us but it's fun now to talk to other we've even some of our customers, small pharmaceutical companies, are interested in using it for um, getting oncologists together to look at data, for having you know collaboration as they think about what the return to work looks like. Maybe maybe their VR is a part of that. So we hope to keep evangelizing for that, and would love to show any of y'all our spaces if you want to come and have a tour. That's one of my favorite things to do. I brought our gallery environment, but I don't want to break anything, Jake. So you tell me if you think that's a good idea, but. Yeah, I don't know when or the others from the AWE team that yeah. set up the space. If you've saved this room as a template, um, so you can basically save entire spaces as a template. Uh, uh, Abby came with some templates so we can basically teleport you to a space uh, in here by loading up her entire space. But what that does is clear all the things that you have in here. Yeah. We don't want to <laughs> clear all the hard work that you put into the space here. Um, so I don't know if you had uh, saved this nope. space as a template um not yet. Happened okay. yet yeah okay. so so i don't know i think when has to do it because he's the host yeah no problem i'll right. I'll, I'll, I'll i'll share a link and people can can hit me up if you want to check it out um but we built we have one the two stories i like to tell her we have one colleague who has he used to work in a lab um, you know, and now he works in at a desk, and so he needs something to tinker with. And he has spent every weekend customizing his office and spatial to the point that it is like a museum. He's hidden things in the walls. There's a chess set. I mean, it's it's out of control. Sometimes I could just go to, just to see what he's doing in there, and um, or to move things around because then he can't find them. So that's fun. And then the other one is this, uh, and we built that with just one of the spatial you know rooms that is out of the box. They're always putting out some really cool um, spaces. And then we also, um, to, to, for a big event, we wanted to kind of introduce VR to our industry, to the to, pharm to pharma and to the um, oncology community. At the end of a big oncology conference this year, we hosted a big party for um, the top, top oncologists and, and pharma VIPs. And we did that in spatial in a custom environment that a group out of Dallas, M2 Studios, built for us that was a museum. It was, it was like, I mean, not, this is a beautiful space. This is just a little bit more um, edgy and it has like a glass ceiling and it has it's nighttime on this, on the side of the a cliff where you can see the sea and everything is kind of angular and, and cool. And we actually started our NFT collection. We have, so we were introducing them to that whole world. So that's a really fun space. I'd love to, to show you all too, to think about the ways, not even to just do getting business done, collaborating, but using VR as a launching point for giving people a new experience that they then connect with your brand and, and, and think about you as a, an innovative partner. Yeah, was there that, anything that, else that you wanted always... me to share? <laughs> I, I, have oh, a question. That, that covered, I think it was, yeah, go there. There's a question. Yeah, let's go for it. Thanks, Jack. Hi, Abby. My name's John. I work for a global creative agency. Um, one of the cool. largest pharma companies is, is my main client. So oh, to right. hear you speak about oncologists, it's, it's my day job. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but my interest is in being one of the first kind of, as you said, colonized metaverse companies, which is a whole new phrase. I love that. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I totally totally get, you know, decking out an environment and inviting people in and, and having meetings and stuff. How have you found the actual live working piece of collaborating in something like Spatial? I mean, I know I've already synced my Google Drive. I've already collaborated mm -hmm. on a live Google Slides deck with someone. We've reviewed creative storyboards in, a, in Spatial before, but I'm just keen in, in the real world, in a real company. What does like, you said you're in five hours a day. Are you working or what, what mm -hmm. does it mean to exist as a business and just in addition to just meeting and bringing people in to see the space? Mm -hmm. Totally. That's a great question. And it's one of the biggest, um, you know, changes getting used to how are you going to do work? What kind of work are you going to do? What kind of work do you need to meet with someone to do? And what kind of work do you do better on your own? You're just kind of shifting that gear. Everything mm -hmm. we actually, for all the time we spend in spatial, we try to be a very low meeting company. So um, there's an interesting twist there. But I found that um, on the Mac, the spatial cast makes it very easy to do almost anything you could do on the web. It, it brings it in almost seamlessly, audio and everything. Um, that's really nice. And, I, and I'm hoping that that's in the roadmap for, for Windows as well. But um, Ooh, all those that things out. you mentioned, we we do as well also and every time i've hung out with the spatial team in spatial i learned something else they <laughs> use the little colored note cards to to organize things and to do just to use the tools that are there in a different way um it's still uh, it's it's not as fast as hopping on a zoom call but there's so many other benefits that for the right projects and and i find it's a lot more um productive conversations. So because I'm not looking at five other things, even with a, a group of maybe even 10 people, you know, you know, on a Zoom call, everyone's not paying attention. But in spatial, you can see them <laughs> nodding, you can see where they're looking, you can tell if they're doing something else, you can take notes, you know, even on audio. So um, it's a little bit of a, a nice brain, it's good work for your brain to figure out, you know, how are we going to use this right and experiment and some things don't work. We've had things fail and be like, well, we can't do that here yet. Let's try something else. One interesting um, thing we did is uh, we wanted to have our whole company in, in one room, you know, our all hands meeting for the quarter. And to, so far, every platform has this limitation, about 30, 35 people is about all the yeah. pixels it can handle. And so we had to get really creative and took them on a tour of everyone was for 10 minutes in five different rooms and they just moved around and the presenters stayed in one room and different people came to them almost like this tour. So you just have to stretch a little bit and um, we always leave a buffer for people to disappear and come back and, you know, find the right room. But um, I've been the little bit of headache it's been in that sense, you know, you can still get, we're still going fast. We still have, big objectives and it's not really slowing us down. Well, that's amazing. Thank you. And so you feel these practices that you've been able to master during this COVID, everyone's remote type environment, mm -hmm. even as we return to the workplace or many companies do, do you feel that many or all of these practices will sustain when the entire world opens up and the majority are back in office again? Do you think it'll sustain? That's interesting. For us, it will personally, because we never had an office, but our customers, you're right, will be uh, will be back in office um, for the most part. So that will be interesting to see. But to date, we, we really haven't had, it's mostly internal that we've been working besides these special events. So um, we'll see. We're host, hoping to host some ad boards in VR this year. So that'll be an interesting if we get to that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Thank, thank you, Abby. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. So I actually brought it out, bringing the, the video so you can see some oh, of our cool. spaces. Um, Maybe are you all using Quest 2 or yeah. some other headsets? Quest 2 or on the web. We probably have still probably 20 to 25 percent still on the web. Mm -hmm. That's the office I was talking about. Nice. That's before you had a test set. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, could you explain cast to us? Is this just the ability to play movies inside of Spatial or? Yep. Yeah. So this is um, a little different. So this is my, my Mac desktop. So I went out. Oh, to it's a desktop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, right. so it's, so um, it's different than like the web screen share uh, in that it's a, like low to zero latency um, screen, uh, screen sharing solution for the desktop for right now for Mac, we're working on bringing it to, to windows as well. Um, but you can see here, I mouse. 
Um, and you can kind of see my hand. My, my Quest is doing hand tracking on my hand because I put my controllers down. Um, so I can basically, you know, work in spatial. Uh, I just cast in my desktop. And now, you know, we all here are kind of centered around my computer. So I can mm-hmm. bring up, you know, a Word document or I can bring up, you know, whatever. Um, and we can all just work. And I can just use my keyboard, which is right here in front of me, um, and my mouse and just, you know, use um, use my computer as if. So it's basically a, rem- remote desktop. Whole, it's like remote yeah, yeah, super yeah, it's yeah. It, it is low it is local um since you know we have to start uh cast on the desktop itself um but mm-hmm. you know the benefit of that we have you know it becomes social and i can also have my mac on a giant screen now yeah. much mm-hmm. bigger than the i already have a big screen but an even <laughs> bigger one um so that's kind of one of the benefits of it and then as more you know as like the quest and other devices add more tracking capabilities and things like you know they just sound pass through mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and keyboard tracking and those things you know um we'll start to bring aspects of that into the into the platform <laughs> too um so you'll just have more of that hybrid work experience um yeah. you know you can bring in your actual workstation into uh into a vr experience like this and to your question also around you know people going back to work as well mm. um you know there's the, the big the the big uh topic is you know the idea of hybrid work and what that's going to mean so you're going to have companies that you know have offices and are and want people to come back into the office but then of course you've had people who have gotten so used to this idea of working from home and don't want to come into the office or you know you have people working from home one or two days a week um and and other people you know you just have this mixed work culture and the ability to have everyone feel included uh, in that uh, whether you choose to work from home or whether you choose to come into the office um, you know that's going to be really important how you deliver that and doing things like a virtual headquarters where everyone is in the virtual space whether that's through an AR headset or a VR headset um, that just from an inclusivity perspective I think is really the only way forward it's not you know, no one wants to be doing you know, a 2D version of, you know, Zoom or Teams uh, forever. Uh, and there's, you know, there's no way to, you can't really, we've all seen, there's no good way to have uh, an effective hybrid work model when you're just staring at a 2D screen. Um, so that's where these technologies are, are going to really come into play. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm really excited about to see them because they're, the technology is here, um, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that, the, how things have sort of fallen together, right? If this would have happened, if you know, pandemic is mm-hmm. horrible, of course. But if this happened ten years ago, we wouldn't have had these kind of technologies, you know, mm. ready um, for us. You know, you you saw Ari go through the history of it, and the technology is extremely advanced back then. But it's it's in, of course, an even better place today. Totally. I have a question. Shoot. Hi. Is um what what sort of use cases? Uh, this is Nicole speaking, I think. Uh, so what, what use cases are the most beneficial for running in spatial? Like where do you see the biggest, um, the biggest bang for the buck? Where do you see the largest uh, ROI uh, for, uh, for using this platform, which is, which is cool? Yeah, Abby, do you want to talk about some of the use cases you guys? Well, uh, for us, there's, there's, there's two main across. ones. There's there's internal collaboration, um, and, and then there's well there's two internal collaboration actually working on a project together, um, and and two uh, culture. We were a kind of a rudderless, you know, we had no home, um, and to have a place we can come, we can invite people to come and get together in one place. Um, as a remote company, it really does feel like human proximity. Um, externally, it's been really neat to, uh, as an experience for customers. So like I said, we hosted this large event. We've also had some, when you send someone a headset, at this point in the evolution of this, when you send someone a headset, they're agreeing to meet with you a few times. So there's an interesting a- aspect there of, of courting. You know, it, it, with pharma, there's compliance issues. They ret- it's, a, it's a loan. They can return it. But there is an element of, mm-hmm. of them committing to a bit of a partnership to think about the future differently and, and to, to align your your company with with forward thinking so at this point before everyone's doing it i think there's a big advantage to that um as a in a mar- as a marketing tool yeah from a and from a like you know larger perspective too you know we're seeing that and more with you know our our user base too and we're starting to see this concept of the work metaverse 
um, really popping up and all the different use cases that there are there. Everything from, you know, our big focus initially was 3D data review. You know, companies like Mattel mm -hmm. bringing in their CAD models and their, and their engineers and designers so they can come into a space and review like new toy designs and things like that and mark them up with sticky notes and 3D annotations and stuff like that. Um, but then that's really started to expand to, I mean, really, I mean, this is, I, I love this space because it, it really gets to that point of, more immersive and, and engaging presentations with that sense of presence because you don't have, have to be sitting in front of a screen and looking at one slide at a time you can really be immersed you know have an experience around you know points you're trying to make so having this kind of historical timeline um of like you know the xr the history of xr and awe is, is a really great example of what a lot of companies are doing is that you can take in a lot of information at one time um, whether you're doing, you know, a design thinking session or a product planning <laughs> session, um, or if you just want to, you know, we see a lot of companies that just want to do virtual offsites, right? How do we keep stay bonded with um, with our our coworkers when we're all, you know, separate from one another and remote from one another? There's only so many, um, you know, uh, uh, games you can play on a Zoom call to to feel connected uh, with one another. But when you can actually go to, you know, uh, uh, a bonfire under the stars, which is one of the. Uh, yeah, I was actually, spatial. I was going to mention that, that the way you can change the tone of a meeting or a room on the fly is really interesting. We have our Monday executive calls around a board table, but if, if the topic gets different, we need to think differently. We can change it to a bonfire and then we're all sitting on the shore together and it really just changes your whole mindset you know you can kind of shake things oh i was like what's happening <laughs> there we go thanks Jane. <laughs> yeah so you can come here there it is wow so yeah i just temporarily changed the environment we'll change it back to the gallery but yeah now we're we got a, a lakeside where is it over there we got the northern lights above us we can have a literal fireside chat next to uh, the bonfire and the benefit is you never have to keep the bonfire going it's an everlasting flame it's a little biblical but um but you got this great uh bonfire here too so um how do you yeah, switch just, yeah, like Abby environments said, jake um so under settings there's a change environment button uh there is um about seven different options right now um for those that you can change to different settings like the auditorium boardrooms um but then you can also uh, take any 3D model that you upload into the space and set that as an environment as well. Um, so the sky's the limit uh, in terms of the types of spaces that you can have. So this is one of our more traditional lounge space. We got some nice lounge chairs outside over here. I think they would like the, the abstract chair. one, Jake. They want to change the abstract. That's very, I call it the matrix space. I think it's Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that too. yeah this one yeah it's, it's kind of the infinite uh -huh. the infinite space let me see if i have any oh here's yeah uh, is this which one is this uh oh yeah so this is um the, the i think oh yeah this is the gallery space um oh, this might so be, this is, yeah, this is like ours yeah space. that'd be like it. ours that's good There we go. Sorry for the the uh, frame rate drop there for a second. So we can come and look at this. You can just come here and look at this model, like we're all kind of doing a model view. But I can actually, or anyone really, can set this model as our shared virtual environment. So I'm going to click a button here. Uh, you're going to see my hand start to do like like I'm swimming or something. Um, but I'm just setting this model as as the shared space. That looks about right. Hold on to your hats, and hopefully you don't have a fear of heights. Just <laughs> temporarily load in, load in the custom environment. That just takes a second. Hey, I'm back. Sorry, Sorry. that you died. Oh. Yeah, I had a bug in. Give this a second. There we go. There it is. There it is. Now, if you, yeah, if you turn around over here, come and join me in this large gallery space. Da -da -da. Come on down. I think I scaled this a little too big. That's okay. okay. No, it's great. Is, it's great this way. The benefit, the benefit wow. of the metaverse is that you can make, make buildings as large as you want. I was just going to put one of our NFTs up. 
<laughs> on the wall. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I've got some here too. So Abby, you build NFTs oh, for oncologists? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we built a museum for them. <laughs> I like this one. Wow. This is just a video actually, but I can't make it. We've got to talk about how to get oncologists on <laughs> this thing. Yes, for sure. Oh, that's a good one. Let me see. Where's my actual? Oh, I don't have the actual this... MetaMask wallet. I can't do that, but. This one is actually on auction at Christie's. Oh, cool. I kind of like it this large, Jake. It feels like it feels really amazing. big. Yeah, larger than This is the biggest room I've been in so far. Yeah. Yeah, I think we now support, we've, we, we've updated it. We now support, I think, spaces that are about 200 by 200 meters. Um, hmm. So for the average non-creative person, Jake, how long would it take to put together something this big? Hey Toshi, what's oh, up? So, so that's gonna come. I'm gonna turn on spatial audio. I'm gonna turn on spatial yes. audio so yes, that we can have some recovery. Yeah. There we go. All right, that's better. Um, so sorry, John. Hey Jake. To yeah. Hey man, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to dive away before my battery died. I had to plug in. Really? Oh, that's all good. So you're saying yeah. how long does it yeah. take to like, yeah, make this space is sick? For yeah, yeah. So um, if I wanted to, I mean. As a non-designer, but you know um, uh, enough to be dangerous, how long what might it take to leverage a template or build? Does this need to be built from scratch to create something as as wide and open as this? No, it doesn't. Um, um, obviously, there are studios that you know that are three D modeling studios. Abby mentioned you know M two was one that that we work really closely with. They know how to build things that are very optimized and performant, but still really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so bring in you know um, environments like this. You can do something as simple as downloading something off a of Sketchfab, and then just import the 3D model into Spatial. You can bring in any 3D model. Um, okay, so you're typically you designing want. off platform and bringing 3D models into the platform. Yeah, yeah. So we're not. Um, we don't Got see it. ourselves as ever replacing like a Blender or like a 3ds Max or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We're just see ourselves as very cross-platform and ingest anything you want to have a shared virtual experience. Um, I so see. you would, yeah, create it on, on Blender or whatever platform and then just bring it in to Spatial and then you can create that into a shared experience. So we have a lot of like 3D artists and 3D render artists who are yeah. starting to bring in, like typically they would just do a rendered image and post that on like Instagram or an NFT marketplace. Um, but what they're doing <laughs> is they can just, uh, uh, export that 3D rendered scene, Got it. optimize it a bit so it can run on a quest, and then just import that model or the animated model into Spatial and set it as the environment. Now it becomes a shared virtual experience, Got uh, it. collaborative experience that we can all yeah, group inside. Yeah, exactly. A group I'm working with has um, leveraged some of some of the template files and brought assets in and kind of made it a home. But we've also collaborated with folks like Krista Kim, you know, who yeah. builds these custom experiences too. She's been an advisor um, that does some of this magic stuff. And I just wonder, does it happen off platform and brought in, or can you do it inside? But it sounds like um, you do it outside and bring it in. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. This is a 3D model, uh, animated 3D model. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. This is cool. Oh, hey, dude. Yeah. That's Alex. He is the UN's first digital ambassador. Fun fact. That's cool. And then we can also you take set a back. We can also set the sky box. So I'm going to put change the out it scene to the Milky Way here, so it can be in space. There we go. So now if you look outside, we're in outer space. Patrick is huge now. Oh my god! Feels like Big brother. Eighty-four Apple advertising. Yeah. So yeah, let's see if I have any other environments. I didn't realize I had this one. So, so Jake, do you bring in um like an environment the same way you do the other assets, or is there a different mm -hmm. process for that? Yep. Yeah. So that just like I think I so you said so I you bring in any free model like this dancing Groot. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really an environment model, but any 3D model. And then if you point, mm -hmm. like for those who are in VR, if you point at Baby Groot, you'll see there's a button mm -hmm. um, that looks like a mountain mm -hmm. uh, on it. So that's oh, yeah. the set. That's the set as environment button. Um, so you oh, literally click that, and then go through another step just to get it to the right scale. And okay. then that's how you set that model as the environment. So any 3D model um, can be mm -hmm. the shared virtual space. Awesome. Yeah. So we can all 
Dance with Navy Groot. Hey. All right. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is a custom environment. So this was one of the, Abby had mentioned um, a custom gallery space that was made for their NFT museum. This is actually that model for that space. Um, so yeah, this is a custom, a custom, uh, custom space. We do have it listed on our support page um, for anyone to download and use. Uh, M2, uh, the studio is letting anyone use this space uh, if they want to within Spatial. Cool. Yeah, that's an awesome. So we have a huge event ongoing right now. Um, called Stratosphere. It's actually 500 NFT artists um, who are being showcased uh, in Spatial, uh, and they're doing an in-person event in uh, in Shanghai uh, that's starting uh, to uh, uh, starting on Saturday. So it's kind of a hybrid event right. um, showcasing 500 NFT artists, which is really cool. And they're using this environment to do it. Mm. Yeah, so right now we do have uh, a limit of 32 people per room. Um, so that's a, like a technical limitation just from like, you know, pixels we can render on a quest and, and web and stuff like that. Um, we are rolling out some additional features um, to help link rooms together more easily. So it'll still be 32 people in a room, but you can have a set of essentially like interconnected rooms um, that people can jump in and out of different spaces uh, together. Um, so right now it's the the 32 person limit. So we tend to focus on more like smaller events. Yeah. Not uh, yet. Toshi, I've seen um, people make like several versions of the same room. If it's like an art situation where you want people to come and go, you can make different instances and just to provide all those links so people can find one that has room. But if you want them all to be a part of the same moment, that's a little bit different. Um, but that's one way to think about it. Yeah. Yep, it's all the same across because in the web, you have the full version of Spatial um, where you have your avatar and you can interact and move around just like everyone else. We don't support large events, but do we do support large groups, as you can mm -hmm. see. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have um, <laughs> tips and tricks on optimizing um, environments to bring into Spatial? Is there any thing in particular that well, even if they download assets from the web, it probably needs to get optimized. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to keep that bigger. It looks like Ori's taking a selfie with Groot, so I'll keep it bigger. Um, so the, the main thing, um, I think, is really around texture size. Um, uh, is, is keep, we support the 2048 by 2048 uh, texture sizes and models. Um, so if you're able to keep that on the smaller side, and then also um, fewer objects. So I think below, like objects within a model. Um, so I think below 100 objects, if you can um, optimize that mesh to have as little few objects as possible, um, what, that's ideal. Um, what about and, polygon counts? Is there a specific polygon count that you, you recommend in terms of? Um, I'd have this, to, you know, environment. I'd have to defer to to our friends at M2 studios mm -hmm. um around that because uh, it can it can vary um greatly the, the thing is if you can keep something below 30 megabytes which is our limitation um oh, okay. and we'll say below um say i'd say 50 uh, objects within a model you mm -hmm. should uh you mm -hmm. should be generally good okay and and for, for yeah. beginners jake that aren't expert 3D creators, were you saying like one of the great platforms to get started with to create models or environments without too much um, design expertise would be Blender or is there another one that's a little more drag and drop for beginners? Um, Blender is, it, it's an open source platform and it's free and there's a lot of great okay. tutorials online to learn that. There's, there's definitely, a, it has a heavy learning curve mm. um, for sure. Uh, I mean, the easiest way to get started, honestly, is to go to a site like Sketchfab, sketchfab.com, which has a huge Sketchfab. library. Yeah, it has a huge library of 3D models, um, and you can just filter on ones that are downloadable. There are, there are tons that are free, and there's uh, tons that are also for sale for like five, ten bucks uh, as well. Uh, and then just bring, they, the thing with those is they obviously can range. You, they may need some optimization. 
Um, but a tool like Blender can do some uh, uh, optimization fairly easily. There's some good tutorials about that. So that's that's what I, I'm not a 3D modeling expert myself. What I tend to do is go to Sketchfab, find something I want um, or something close to what I want. Um, if it's above 30 megabytes, I'll bring it into Blender and do uh, a decimation on it, um, which can take you know just a couple minutes to do, uh, depending on the size, uh, and then just in, uh, export that as a GLB. Uh, which is what we convert to anyway. When you bring stuff into spatial, we automatically convert it into a GLB file anyway. Um, so having it as a GLB to start with just avoids any um, uh, unexpected, you know, upload issues um, from what um, during that conversion process. Uh, and then just bringing the GLB file into spatial, and you're good to go. Okay, so Sketchfab, uh, something under 30 meg sort by what you want and bring it straight in as so what was the file format that um sketchfab was it obj did you say uh sketchfab it depends on, on the file itself i think most files on sketchfab tend to be gltf or fbx oh, GL. um which work okay yeah which which work with us also like you can just bring those in as is um into spatial um which is perfectly fine um okay and if something's bigger than 30 meg bring it into blender optimize it down Export from there, then bring mm -hmm. it in. Yep, exactly. John, you can Perfect. also, you. they added recently, I don't know how long ago, Jake, but this memory usage, <laughs> if you go to your settings, you can kind of see the load on the room um, that you're in. And so you can tell if things start to slow down or get weird, you can kind of tell what's going on. Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't know like what those stats mean, close. but I try to stay under the red line. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good practice. Practice. Yeah, it's just it's just to avoid any performance issues on headset. Like we're getting close to like the texture memory because we have the space. We have a lot of models that we're starting to duplicate and things like that. Um, so it just helps yep. you be aware before we start hitting any performance issues. And is that a mixture of um, bandwidth issue uh, specs of the headset and the spatial application itself, or, or where is that strain coming from? Or all it's three? really just from the headset. So what uh, the max texture okay. memory limits from like in this case the Quest Two. Ah, perfect. Yep. And you yeah. need to bake all of the, the textures, right, In, even for the environments. Yeah, yeah, them. baking the texture. Yeah, you can see, like, some of the, the lighting here on the panels, those are all baked baked light uh, uh, on those textures. Do we want to keep this keep this space? Is that cool? Or do you want to <laughs> switch back to the smaller gallery space? All right, sounds good. Thank you, Patrick.